In the Witcher book series, there are a lot of characters who meet different types of moral classifications. There's sometimes understanding behind unethical choices that leaves the reader questioning whether or not a character can actually be considered a villain. Sometimes, however, there are characters who make almost nothing but unscrupulous decisions, but because of Sapkowski's tendency to create nuanced characterization, one could still have room to wonder, do these decisions make them outright evil, or can there be some understanding of what led them down this path? This brings us to Ciri and the Rats. If you aren't familiar with the novels, we're not talking about rodents. The Rats are a gang of six teens, or young adults, who are infamous for stealing, killing, and cruelty. They love wearing gaudy, ornate clothing and accessories, but even in their flamboyant attire, they manage to evade the local authorities in part due to the system they developed of bribing potential village informers and killing the ones who do inform on them. They're made up of Giseller, their leader, Iskra, an elf, Missile, with whom Ciri has a romantic relationship, Kaylee, Asa, Reef, and eventually Ciri, who goes by the alias Falca during her time in the gang. The rats have never accepted new members in their gang until they met Ciri, who hadn't yet developed the habits of a criminal gang member prior to meeting the rats. This doesn't occur until she becomes a member of their gang, creating a more sinister and villainous persona for her. Prior to Ciri's time with the rats, the reader learns about and even witnesses a lot of tragic events that took place in her life. Similarly, the six members of the Rats gang suffered trauma through their formative years, eventually leading to their villainous outcomes. So the Rats do terrible and moral things, but does a troubled past make their actions understandable or forgivable? Or are they outright definitively bad? And can we understand and forgive Ciri, who starts killing and robbing, since it's probably a result of the suffering and tragedy she's experienced, combined with the influence from this newfound family? To answer these questions, let's examine the crimes they commit a little closer, as well as what they've each suffered in the past. The Rats gang has quite the list of offenses. They lay in wait to rob unexpected travelers on the highways. They murder the escorts simply for defending themselves and the people they're escorting. One of them, Kaylee, attempts to force himself on Siri her first night with the group. Another one, Missile, succeeds where Kaylee fails. They plundered and murdered, and their cruelty became legendary. They attacked, robbed, and killed for entertainment. The rats adored killing. And when Siri joins, she engages in the same activities as the rest of them. The situation with the rats, of course, is not comparable to the classic stealing food to feed your starving family. These criminal acts cannot be considered justifiable as acts of desperation. They rob and kill not out of necessity, but for fun. But based on the descriptions of their troubled pasts and the state of the world they grew up in, it's likely that their malevolent lifestyle wouldn't have happened under better circumstances. Their troubled pasts, along with no available healthy coping mechanisms, as well as the absence of positive role models, shaped them into the evident corrupt villains they became. They were a strange mixed bag created by war, misfortune, and contempt. War, misfortune, and contempt had brought them together and thrown them onto the bank. One of the overarching plot points of the Witcher series is Nilfgaard's invasion and hostilities against the continent's northern countries. Since these countries are a primary setting, the reader is given a lot of insight into the impacts the Nilfgaardian invasion has on civilians. In the short story Something More, Dandelion tells Geralt during the first Nilfgaardian war, this isn't an ordinary war about succession to a throne or a small scrap of land. It's not a skirmish between two feudal lords, which peasants watch while leaning on their pitchforks. There's never been a war like this. The Nilfgaard army are leaving scorched earth and bodies behind them, entire fields of corpses. This is a war of destruction, total destruction, Nilfgaard against everyone. And in Baptism of Fire, during the second Nilfgaardian war, Geralt, Dandelion, and Milva pass by dozens of atrocities committed by the Nilfgaardians on ordinary citizens. Of course, like Geralt tells Dandelion in Something More, there is and has never been a war without cruelty. But when it comes to Nilfgaard, it's demonstrated that the impacts on civilians are worse than in most wars. And when Nilfgaard is met with insurgency, they retaliate with extraordinary force, showing mercy to no one. 
Before their invasion of the Northern Kingdoms, Nilfgaard had already conquered nations to the south, essentially replicating the actions we're familiar with from their endeavors in the Northern Territories. The rats, with the exception of Reef, lived in these countries when they were attacked, and each one of them suffered from its effects. The cellar deserted from the army who fought back against Nilfgaard, and later got caught up in a gang of other deserters and fugitives, constantly dodging Nilfgaardian forces. What was left of his gang was decimated by forest elves, but Giseller survived, although taking an arrow to the shoulder. He was taken care of by the elf Iskra, who, by other elves, was condemned to banishment, or rather, condemned to death, since free elves did not survive on their own. Kaylee woke to find his adoptive family killed during a punitive expedition sent by Nilfgaard. Reef was a Nilfgaardian soldier on that punitive expedition who got injured and was left to die by his brothers in arms. Missal, originally a noble-born girl, got separated from her family while the city was fleeing the approaching Nilfgaardian pacifiers, wandered alone for days, and then was kidnapped by manhunters searching for girls who had been untouched and physically verified that this was the case. She witnessed Nilfgaardian marauders executing the manhunters who abducted her, and she remained among the surviving girls for reasons beyond imagination. Later, being the only one to survive, she was left for dead in a ditch until she was found by Asa. Asa found her while he was on a personal revenge mission, hunting the Nilfgaardians he witnessed kill his entire family. All six members experienced unthinkable tragedies and found themselves alone immediately following these events at young, impressionable ages. But the loneliness ended when they found each other. The three pairs came together at a festival. They didn't take long to find each other in the merry crowd. They had too much in common. They were united by their love of gaudy, colorful, fanciful outfits, of stolen trinkets, beautiful horses, and of swords. They stood out because of their arrogance and conceit, overconfidence, mocking truculence, and impetuousness, and their contempt. They were children of the time of contempt, and they had nothing but contempt for others. The trauma that they had each experienced created an ugliness in them that made them hate the world and take their inner demons out on anyone, kind of like how school bullies typically have bad home lives. These unfortunate similarities bonded them to one another and protected them from isolation while losing their ability to feel empathy or guilt in the process. When we consider that the rats became criminals as a result of their brutal experiences, it comes as no surprise that when Siri meets them, she quickly falls in with them and adopts their nature. Siri's integration into their group means she exclusively accompanies and maintains a close connection with them. And like the rats, her past was a particularly troubled one. As Siri is one of the protagonists of the story, we get a lot more backstory on her. At a young age, she lost her mother and father, then later lost her beloved grandmother. She was spirited out through the city of her home while it was raised by foreign invaders amidst fire and the torture and murder of innocents. During this moment, she experienced utter paralyzing terror. It was then that she was taken by a man strange to her who haunted her nightmares for countless nights. After later receiving two caring foster parents, Geralt and Yennefer, she was hunted on Thanad and then suddenly separated from them by a portal that transported her and stranded her to a harsh, scorching desert where she suffered for many cruel days and nights. While in the desert, she faced thirst and starvation, not to mention a strong sense of abandonment from being alone and helpless. The reader knows Geralt and Yennefer did not abandon Ciri. Geralt was even tirelessly striving to find her. But lost in her suffering, she ascribed the pain to abandonment. She was then found by trappers who beat and restrained her and discussed forcing themselves on her until she escaped with the rats. Siri struggled with isolation immediately following tragedy on multiple occasions. Isolation can remove all feelings of safety and security from a person. Her desire to belong and to not be alone drove her to join the rats gang who, from all appearances, were not suitable company to keep. Additionally, all of the other horrors she had been through slowly created spite, hate, and an unhealthy craving for revenge until it boiled to the surface. The acceptance into the Rats Gang and their influence allowed these negative feelings to express themselves through cruel acts. When the Rats met Siri, they could quickly sense the similarities they shared with her from the time when they were alone, filled with grief and fear and surviving through a time of contempt. And so they accepted and welcomed her into their gang because of it. She was as they had once been, like each one of them, lonely and full of bitterness. Bitterness for what the time of contempt had taken from her. 
and in times of contempt, anyone who is alone must perish. Otherwise, they wouldn't have accepted her. They accepted no one new before. Several times, in fact, the local prefix had tried to infiltrate their gang with traitors, but to no avail because they detested strangers. Siri takes on a villainous persona during her time in the gang. Just like them, she robs and kills for enjoyment. Eventually, the killing becomes so normalized to her that not only does she have no problem doing it, she even begins to take a fascination with it. One instance when Siri participates in gang activities involves the act of robbing a carriage. Siri arrives at the scene after the rest of the group, only to discover that the escorts have already been slain. When she sees this, she's filled with disappointment and fury, a pretty extreme reaction to not getting to murder an innocent person. Her anger subsides when she notices that one of the escorts is still alive. She attacks the man, and when she lands the final mortal blow, she doesn't immediately flee the scene, but stays a moment to watch him bleed to death, feeling a familiar fascination with watching a person desperately cling to life. Once he passes, she rides off without looking back as the murder she's committed had no effect on her conscience. During another moment, the rats visited a market where Siri and Missile are accosted by a drunk man who Siri quickly killed as he attempted to lay a hand on her. The very next thing she does after taking his life is express disappointment over dropping her cotton candy. She's become so accustomed to these actions that they no longer stir any normal emotions within her. While this disturbing response she has to murder is an expression of the demons inside her, her reactions to such acts were once devoid of this disconcerting nature. Siri didn't show any villainous signs prior to joining the gang. She never killed anyone or committed any other criminal acts. Before this evolution, she was a pretty relatable child with typical feelings and responses to things. There's a scene where Croc on Crate tells Yennefer that while in Skellige during Siri's childhood, she was often mischievous. She was a young devil, not a lion cub. But being a mischievous child doesn't usually imply a future of immoral behavior. And there are plenty of examples of her showing thoughtfulness towards those she cared for, and even for strangers. Even after the witchers taught her how to fight and kill, she doesn't show any inclinations to use these skills unnecessarily. There's sometimes a desire for revenge, but never for senseless violence. In Blood of Elves, when the convoy is attacked on the way to the Melitale Temple, Siri cannot muster up the strength to kill an elf even out of self-defense, and Geralt has to take the responsibility upon himself. The day she met the rats, she escaped with them from a village. During the escape, some of the villagers try to violently stop the gang. Siri gets a chance to kill one of the men, attempting to kill her, but she's again unable to muster up the will to murder someone even in a situation where it's self-defense. Her hesitation doesn't last long as she kills the next villager who goes after her. This moment made her sick to her stomach and haunted her dreams for a long time. She wanted to throw her weapon as far away as possible, so disgusted with what she had done. So we see that even on the day that she met the gang, she still wasn't showing any natural tendencies of immorality. There are other ways where we see how her perception of death in particular warped over time. When she enters the Tower of the Swallow, she sees human bones on the ground and looks at them with indifference, thinking death is simply death and a dead person is just a cold corpse. It's not important where it's lying, where its bones decay. These thoughts take place right after recalling the past feelings she had at Kaer Morhen about the skeletons left in the moat after the castle was besieged, and how she felt that it was wrong that they were not given a respectful burial. Since there's no evidence to suggest that Ciri had any natural occurring evil tendencies, we can deduce that her harrowing experiences over the course of her lifetime combined with the rats' influence is what turned her into a monster. This part of her arc is to demonstrate the process through which a person can become morally corrupt. We've established what the rats have done, what Ciri's done as a gang member, and the ins and outs of what was involved in shaping their character roles. So, taking all of these details into consideration, can we declare that the rats are evil? Yes, the rats are undoubtedly made up of bad people. Their need to cope with their painful histories is understandable, and it's okay to feel sorry about what happened to them but that still doesn't change the fact that they actively and regularly decide to rob and murder innocent people and have a fun time while doing it. So yes, the rats, including Siri or Falca rather, are bad, they're immoral, and they're villains. But it's important to note that their decisions aren't very important for their own character development. With their limited presence throughout the entire story and their lack of any redeeming qualities, these characters serve more as a tool to facilitate Ciri's transition to the dark side. 
Sapkowski wanted to show that almost anyone can be corrupted given the right circumstances. In Siri's case, the circumstances were undeniably fitting. When a person is young and impressionable, they're more likely to be influenced by the people they spend most of their time with, as long as their need to belong is satisfied. And the rats did that for Siri. They provided her with an escape from the desolation, as well as an outlet to unleash her inner demons. In Siri's state of heightened anger and psychological pain, she was more likely to be drawn to people who amplified her feelings, even though their intentions and actions were clearly morally questionable. The merchant and associate of the rats, Hotspurn, tells Siri, You are an innocent victim, Falca. You aren't even 16. You ended up in the rats gang by accident. It's not your fault that one of the bandits, Missile, took a fancy to you. You were dominated by Missile. He said this to support his argument that Siri would be granted clemency should she decide to turn herself in to the local authorities, but it partly describes the motivation behind her induction and tenure in the gang. In addition to the rat's influence, Siri didn't have anyone else around or the means to get back to her loved ones. Had she not been faced with a threat of isolation, she may have not joined the gang and gone down this dark path. While some people might be more cautious and selective about who they share their lives with, some people are more prone to seeking any form of companionship when feeling alone. One of the moments Siri and Missile share together shows Siri quickly growing frustrated and snapping at Missile when she's simply trying to have fun with her. Missile's response is to say, I don't understand why you don't leave if being with me is so awful. To that, Siri says, I don't want to be alone. So she'd rather be with a partner who not only recently forced herself on her, but who she doesn't even like being around, just to avoid being alone. There's certainly other factors that go into this besides just the evasion of loneliness, but the evasion of loneliness is pretty important here. There's even a moment when Geralt expresses the danger of isolation when he thinks Ciri has been captured by Nilfgaard with no one nearby to care for her. He tells Dandelion, I can't just leave her to her fate. She's completely alone. She cannot be left alone, Dandelion. You'll never understand that. No one will ever understand that, but I know. If she remains alone, the same thing will happen to her as once happened to me. When you look at the big picture, it would be rather impressive if a young person faced with consistent trauma, bad influences, and vulnerability to harsh loneliness didn't undergo a dark transformation. Of course, not all trauma survivors are fated to live evil lives. It's a possible result, especially in the case where your only role models are immoral, and probably more so in a rough, unforgivable medieval environment. Ultimately, Siri evolves into a bad person for a period of time, and it kind of sucks to see a character you've been rooting for turn to the dark side. But it's also an interesting trope where one of the story's most important characters has a period of being bad, as it creates a surprising and interesting transformative effect for their character. Thank you for watching this video. For more content on The Witcher, I have an entire podcast where I review the eight book series chapter by chapter, and I also create one-off Witcher videos on occasion. They can all be found here on this channel. And if that doesn't make you sick of me, I do also have a gaming channel and I do live streams on Twitch a couple of days a week where I play fantasy genre games. All links to the aforementioned content are in the description.